All right, turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 14. Uh, do pray for the youth. We've got 14 people up at uh, youth camp up at uh, Green Valley Lake right now. I've, I've seen some videos online. I love the worship. When I was a youth pastor, it was my favorite week of the year in the summer. And then we'd go for a weekend in the winter. And it's just great to see a bunch of teenagers worshiping with hundred, uh, hundreds of other teenagers. And just to see them worshiping the Lord and there's no, you know, no uh, distractions up there. And just pray that God will really minister to them and they'll bring back what, what God speaks to their hearts while they're up there. Amen? All right, turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 14. And let's open with a word of prayer and dig into the Word. Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you, Lord. We thank you for our time in the Word this morning. We ask that your Holy Spirit would be our teacher. Again, not the words of man, but the Word of God would go forth with power. We thank you that you are a God of love and grace and mercy, but you're also a God of divine order. And so, Lord, this morning I pray as we study your word, we have a better understanding of the fact of, of the gifts you've given us and how they are to be used. We ask these things in your holy and your precious name we pray, and all God's people said, Amen. I think we're light. Any, we don't have anybody doing the overheads, or do we? Okay, so no overheads today, uh, because all of our children's teacher, two of our children's teachers are up, and so Rodrigo's teaching the children. So if you want an outline, they are on the back table, so go grab one because it's not going to be up behind me like it normally is. So let's just catch you up. First Corinthians, we've talked about this, Corinth, Corinth by the sea, if you will. It was a sea city, a city on the, in the sea that uh, was very lost. It was a city that was caught up in idolatry, caught up in seeking after the wisdom of men. Uh, it was a country that was very, uh, a city that was very wealthy. And it was also a city where a church had been planted by Paul, some five years earlier, he was there for 18 months. The church was doing well. Pa Paul had been gone for five years. He gets a letter from the church with some questions and concerns. Uh, the first seven chapters or so, he's reminding them of who they are in Christ. And then he starts talking about marriage and division in the church. And, and the last few chapters, he's been talking about spiritual gifts. And we talked about how every gift is important. If you're here this morning and you're born again, God's given you spiritual gifts. And so we want to recognize what are those gifts. A burden is a spawning ground of a calling. If you've got a heart or a passion for something in particular, uh, the first ministry that I was involved in was children's ministry, much like Pastor Tim. And then uh, God, Pastor asked me to pray about working with youth. I, I was a youth pastor for 15 years. So I loved teenagers on purpose. Amen. <laughs> And I spent 15 years loving on teenagers. I still love teenagers. That will never change. But a burden is the spawning ground of a calling. So remember the text we talked about, you know, for all eyes, where would be the hearing, right? So you all have, you have gifts I don't have. I have gifts you don't have. And the body of Christ is healthy when we're all using the gifts God's given us. Then last week, we saw not only are we to use gifts, but the heart from which the gifts are to be used. And I told the message last week, true love. What is true love? And we, we're to do everything in love. It says if we have a gift, even if we speak the tongues of men or angels, but we don't have love, we're just making a bunch of noise. And, the great, and it says at the end of that chapter, you know, in these three things, faith, hope, and love, those are the things that should be evident in our lives, but the greatest of those gifts is love. It's pretty amazing that it says the gift of love is greater than the gift of faith. That's pretty powerful because, again, faith without love is going to be fruitless. And that's why my prayer for all of you, hey, if this is your first time here today, I hope you know that we love you. And I say this all the time, that every time we get together, I feel like it's a family reunion. That's why I hug every one of you, some of you a couple, three times every Sunday, amen? And the reason is because it's a family reunion, we're coming together, and everything we do needs to be done from a heart of love. You've heard me say it many times, so one more won't hurt you. Truth without love is brutality. Love without truth is hypocrisy. That's why we speak the truth in love. Some people say they're loving people, but they don't love them enough to tell them the truth. And some people are really bold with the truth, but they don't do it in love. And my prayer is that we have both. Can we say amen to that? So now as we look at chapter 14 today, he's going to continue to talk about love, but he's going to talk about the gift, one of the gifts that was being debated in the Corinthian church, and the gift was tongues. Some of you are like, oh no, why did I come here today? <laughs> oh no. And we saw that Paul said that tongues were for today, and it was a gift that he had, but he also said it was the least of the gifts. And when it comes to tongues, and we'll talk, it's not just about tongues, it's also about prophecy this morning, but tongues is one of those gifts that can have two radical extremes. I remember being a young man and going to a church with a friend, 
and it was so hyper emotional they literally had someone up front ringing a chime and everybody just started speaking in tongues all at once and i was like 12 or 13 and i thought these people have lost their minds and you know what the bible says that's not biblical we'll see that this morning Oh, I heard people, I had people say to me, oh, the Spirit fell on our church so much that we were all just speaking in tongues for an hour straight and we never got to the Bible. We just went home. And now I know that's not God. Can we say amen to that? So there's that extreme. But then the other extreme is, well, that gift died with the apostles. And we saw last week in its context that the gifts did not die with the apostles. And that which is perfect has come is not speak, was not speaking about the Bible or the first coming of Christ, but the second coming of Christ when we see him face to face. So here's, here's my heart. Whatever gifts God has for me, I want them all. How about you? And I want to take the gifts he's given me and I want to use them for his glory. Can we say amen to that? So this morning, we're going to look at things being done decently and in order. Is our God a God of order? Our human body is, I, I took an anatomy class and I remember taking anatomy and I thought, anybody who takes anatomy and doesn't get, doesn't get saved or believe in God is not paying attention. <laughs> Amen? You look at the human body, are you kidding me? You look at DNA, our God's a God of order. You look at the universe we live in, is our God a God of order? You move, you move us 1% closer to the sun or 1% further away, we either freeze or we burn and we die. God's a God of order. Guess what? If he's a God of order in the universe, he's a God of order in, in our bodies, he's absolutely a God of order in the church. Can we say amen to that? So, yes, we want to use our gifts, but we need to be doing them decently and in order, the way that God commands. So if you have your outline, grab it. I tell the message, God's divine plan for the use of spiritual gifts. Three proofs. We're going to see three proofs that gifts are being used are from the Lord. You know, some people manufacture a gift and it's not real. How do we know if anything that's either taught or said or done is from the Lord? How do we know? The Word of God. The Word of God is always the foundation. I've had people come and tell me things that contradicted the Word of God. Well, God told me it's okay for me to, and it disagrees with the Word of God. You're wrong, pastor. But I'm telling you, God, no, God did not tell you because God's Word is true. Let God be true and every man a liar. Can we say amen to that? So God is a God of divine order. We check everything against the word of God. And we're going to see the principles that ought to govern our public church services. And the three things we'll see are edification, understanding, and order. So these are things we'll see in this morning's text. First of all, if the gift is truly from God, they will edify or build up the body. We talked about this. When you use a gift, you glorify God and you minister to others. Amen? So when God gives you a gift, it's for his glory and for the benefit of others. And too often, people want a gift that will only benefit them. God doesn't give you gifts just to benefit you. God gives you gifts so you can minister to others. Can we say amen to that? And so that he might be glorified. So the three things we're going to see this morning, first of all, they must edify, encourage the body, be a blessing to the body. Secondly, there must be understanding within the body. Some of you may have a background where you went to churches, and I'm, I've had friends, and I'm not picking on these people necessarily, but they would go to churches where the whole service was in Latin. And you do the lean to the left, lean to the right, stand up, sit down, fight, fight, fight thing, and it's all in Latin, and then you go home. And you're like, and then people would go, yeah, I went, yeah, I went. why did you go? Because I have to. What did you learn? Nothing. Sometimes I, I just feel like I'm in God's presence. There's statues of him everywhere, so he must be there. And, you know, I, and they're speaking, in, I don't know what they said. I have no idea, and then I went home. Guys, if there's no understanding, it's a waste of time. Can we say amen to that? Deep truths can be taught simply. I have people debate that with me. Oh, no, if they're deep truths, they're going to be deep. Did Jesus teach deep truths simply? He's the greatest teacher ever. Can we say amen to that? And did he not use illustrations? Did he not use parables? Didn't he take deep truths and make them simple? My dad was a pastor for 60 years. He's in heaven now. But he used to say all the time, son, keep the cookies on the bottom shelf so everybody can reach them. And what that means is take deep truths and teach them in such a simple way that a 10-year-old could understand. Can we say amen to that? Too often what happens when you want to make sure people know how gifted you are, 
Some people who have the gift of teaching will try to dazzle you with their knowledge and do it, like try to prove that they earned their paycheck or something because they're talking to you at such a level that nobody in the room understands what they're talking about. I hear guys on the radio and I'm driving along and I'm like, I know a little bit about the Bible and I got no idea what this guy's talking about. I have no idea. There's one guy who's got a call-in program for Bible answers and his answers never, I'm like, if I don't get it, not to say I know everything, but I've been a pastor for over 30 years and I didn't understand that answer. How is the person who called in who's not even saved yet going to understand that answer? So we need to see that when a gift is used, for the kingdom of God, and it's truly from the Lord, it will edify the body, and there will be understanding within the body. Can we say amen to that? You know why I'm so repetitive? Because we need to understand. Can we say amen? Santa Cruz had one guy who would tell me all the time, Pastor Dave, you're just so repetitive. You're so repetitive, it drives me crazy. You're so repetitive. And I'm like, bro, what was last week's message about? Uh, that's why I'm repetitive. <laughs> amen? For God, when you got to the driveway, you need to be reminded, amen? So first, it needs to edify. Second, it needs to be understood. And then thirdly, it must be done decently and in order. Do you know the Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit is not the author of confusion? Amen? In Santa Cruz, the church I pastored, there's a church down the road, and this guy started coming to our church. He, had left our, he came to our church, he would go there too. He goes, you know what I love about that church? It's so organic. Well, I already knew, just, yeah, we're in Santa Cruz, okay, it's organic, it's probably range-free and GMO, whatever, yeah, okay, it's organic. I go, what does that mean? He goes, well, we don't have a pastor, we all just get there, and then halfway through worship, we say, who feels led to teach something? And somebody gets up and starts teaching, and while they're teaching, if someone else gets up, feels led, they'll stand up and start talking at the same time, and then people will interrupt with a tongue over here, and I'm like, bro, that's just not biblical. Can we say amen to that? If someone's teaching the word, is that a gift that comes from the Holy Spirit? What's the answer? If somebody's speaking in tongues, is that a gift that comes from the Holy Spirit? They're not going to compete with each other. Can we say amen to that? But you see churches where it's just mayhem. And they think it's a spiritual thing and it's, it's driven by dead emotionalism with no foundation in the word of God. Guys, our God's a, a God of emotion. Can we say amen to that? And we should have joy. Can we say amen to that? So we should have emotion, but it should be in check, done decently and in order. So let's begin there looking at God's divine plan for the use of spiritual gifts, and we're going to see the principles that, gov that should be governing the way we do church. Uh, people often want, and I've had people say that, well, you know, you got, you know, church, it's just so, you know, you do worship, and then you have a message, and then people hang out and eat donuts. You know, and you have communion once a month, you know. And where is that in the Bible? It's in Acts 2.42. <laughs> they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, the breaking of bread, fellowship, and prayer. Can we say amen to that? It's biblical. And so we come. Shouldn't worship lead the way? Wasn't, didn't Judah lead the way, the children of Israel, and his name means praise? So we begin our service worshiping God, because that's where it should begin. Can we say amen to that? It's a glimpse of heaven. But as we worship, God prepares our hearts to receive from his word. And you don't need my opinions. That's a waste of time. This is not a pep rally. This is a Bible study. Amen? Amen? This is not the Elks Club. This isn't, we're not coming up here to do rah rah. No, we're coming up here to study the word of God. And nobody should ever get up and teach the word of God who hasn't studied for themselves and isn't prepared to do so. Can we say amen to that? I had a friend who left a church, and he was telling me, he started coming to our church in Santa Cruz. He goes, I told the pastor, if, you know, if, you don't, if you're not going to bother studying, I'm not going to bother listening. If you won't take the time to study, I'm not going to take the time to listen. So I want to encourage you, if you're teaching the, the five-year-olds, you better be studied up. Can we say amen to that? Don't ever get up and teach anybody anything in the Word of God without being prepared to do so. Amen? And that's part of that calling and that gifting. So let's begin there looking at First, we're going to see how do we know the gifts are God's divine plan for gifts, and how do we know that the gifts are from the Lord? First of all, they edify. Look at verse 1 of chapter 14. It says, pursue love. Now, keep in mind that in the Bible, the chapter breaks are not divinely inspired necessarily. They're placed there just so you could find a spot in the Bible. Can we say amen to that? If we didn't have verses, it'd be like, go to the place where it says pursue love. We'd all be sitting for an hour and a half trying to find it. 
So it, the previous chapter, how does it end? It says, and now abide faith, hope, and love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. And then he says, pursue love. I love that it says pursue love. As chapter 13 so brilliantly declared, the preeminence of the priority of, what's the word for love there? What's the word for love there in Greek? What is it? Agape. So it's not, it's not the eros love that's self-centered love. We, we actually would call it lust. It's not the brotherly love. It's, it's not the love you might have for a pet. It's the, it's the giving love. It's the selfless love. So he says, pursue agape. Pursue selfless love. Agape is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. The greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. So the greatest commandment is to love God and love people. It's to agape God, selflessly love God, and selflessly love people. That's the commandment that came directly from the Lord. And he said again, without agape, everything we do is noise. So if I get up here and I go through a lesson and I don't do it in love and I don't share it with love and I don't apply it to your lives, what have I done? It says I'm a clanging cymbal. I'm just making a bunch of noise. The Bible says they shall know us by the love we have one for another. So the word there to pursue means to follow after or to track down. Pursue love. Never thought about that before? You actually pursue it. You actually seek it out. How do I grow in love? I want to tell you the way you're going to grow in agape. Agape is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. So you must be walking in the fullness of the Holy Spirit and you grow in your relationship with the Lord and the Holy Spirit by spending time in His Word. Can we say amen to that? So as we do that, we'll find that we'll have a supernatural love for people. I'll tell you another way that my love increases for people, that our love will increase for one another, is when we pray for each other. Can we say amen to that? When the church directory is done, I will pray through it every single week. Our church in Santa Cruz got to be very large. I would pray through it every week. If you fill out a prayer request, I'm praying for you several times a day. Most of you know I have a full-time job. Sometimes my drive is an hour and a half, and I will spend that entire time praying for all the prayer requests. You know what happens when you pray for people? God gives you a greater love for them. Can we say amen to that? Prayer doesn't change God's mind. It changes our hearts. And so we're to pursue love, we're to pursue agape, we're to track it down, we're to go after it. Love increases, it overflows when there is less of me and more of the Holy Spirit. Can we say amen to that? The fruit of the Holy Spirit is love. The fruit of Dave is selfishness. Amen? And pride, and bitterness, and anger, and what, just go down, lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, and pride of life. Amen? Left to ourselves... Our desires are ungodly. The only way we desire godly things is if we are filled with and walking in the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, of men born among women, there's been none greater than John the Baptist. And John the Baptist said, I must decrease that he might increase. John the Baptist, Jesus said the greatest man ever lived outside of himself was John the Baptist. And guess what? John the Baptist said, there's got to be less than me and more of him. If that's true of the greatest man who ever lived, it's true of every one of us. Can we say amen to that? There needs to be less than me. I don't need to esteem myself. I need to die to self, and I need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. So notice what it says there. Pursue love. Track it down. Have a, a heart of love. Then he says, and desire spiritual gifts. So desire spiritual gifts. So some people want gifts so they can be in a position where they're seen by people. That's not why you should desire gifts. Can we say amen to that? I want a gift so I will be more important. I want to have a title. I want to be Deacon Dave or Elder Dave or, you know, whatever. I want, I want, a, I want a badge I can wear at church and show how important that I am, right? And there's people that pursue a position. He's not talking about pursuing a position. He says pursue spiritual gifts. Why? Because spiritual gifts are given by God to glorify God and minister to others. So as believers, we should desire to glorify God and minister to others. And how do we increase in our ability to do that? We use the gifts that God's given us. Can we say amen to that? And so he says, pursue or desire spiritual gifts. 
So even though the believers in Corinth were abusing the gifts, they misunderstood the gifts, it didn't mean that they should deny the work of the Spirit going forward, but to properly understand how to use the gifts God's given them. A common response today of having witnessed the abuse of the spiritual gifts is to forsake them altogether. Right? Well, I went to this church and they did some crazy stuff, so I just don't want anything to do with any of that. You know, here at Calvary Chapel, we don't pass an offering and we never will. And one of the things a lot of people have is they go to churches that beat them up. Um, we have someone who goes to church here that said the church he went to, they would pass an offering up to 12 times a service. They just keep passing it until they got what they needed. It's coming back around. <laughs> coming back around. Dig deeper. Coming back around. That's just nonsense. Can we say amen to that? But because so much has been abused when it comes to finances in churches, some people feel like they shouldn't give at all. Are we called to give? What's the answer? But we don't give so we can get the whole seed giving word of faith nonsense. Amen. We don't give so we can get. We give because he already gave. Amen. We give with a cheerful heart. I get to give. I don't want to do it with the right heart. And so what happens with spiritual gifts sometimes, we see them abused. So then we go to the other extreme. We want nothing to do with it. Well, he says here, desire spiritual gifts. If you're here today and you've been a Christian any length of time, look, if you're a new believer, just hang out. Just come and hang out. We want to love on you and feed you. But eventually, we grow past that new stage. We grow past being spiritual you know, babes. And we start to mature. And as we're maturing, we ought to be using our gifts. Can we say amen to that? I want to encourage you. God's given you gifts I don't have. I want to encourage you to use those for the kingdom of God. Again, just because they've been abused by others or falsely attempted to counterfeit spiritual gifts, it doesn't mean we should be satisfied with less than all that God has for us. Notice what he says there about the gifts, especially that you may prophesy. So tonight, t- this morning, there's going to be two gifts emphasized in this chapter, prophecy and tongues. He's going to talk about both of them at length. Prophecy, we talked about this uh, two weeks ago, it's foretelling and foretelling of truth. Uh, more, most often we see it in, in just the foretelling, just speaking it. You know, this is the gift of prophecy right now when we study the Bible. Amen? Not because the Bible is prophetic. Amen? We open it up. We read it. That gift is being used to proclaim the truth of God's word. There is another application to that word, and it's it's somebody who's given a a word of wisdom or word of knowledge where they tell you something. Uh, God speaks to them. Um, But prophecy is men and women speaking to men and women about God. It's God speaking through us to others for him. Can we say amen to that? So prophecy is God speaks through somebody to other people. That's prophecy. We're going to see later that tongues is us speaking to God about men. And prophecy is men speaking to men about God. Okay? And so he says, look, pursue the gifts, but the one you should is prophecy. While the Corinthian believers had overemphasized the gift of tongues, they were underemphasizing the gift of prophecy, and Paul puts the gifts in their proper order, their importance within the body of Christ. Again, you heard me say, that one guy said, yeah, we'll go to this church, man. Sometimes we just speak in tongues for an hour and a half straight, we go home. Romans 10, 17 is is the theme verse for this church, and his faith comes by hearing, and hearing by? Word Word of God. Not tongues for an hour and a half, out of control with no interpretation. Can we say amen to that? So, yeah, the gift of tongues is for today. They they can be used in a believer's meeting. They're done decently in order. We'll talk about that. But the gift of prophecy should take place every time we have church. Amen? Every time we have a Bible study. As Ashley teaches the Bible study to the women, that's the gift of prophecy. As the men teach in the men's study, as the Word of God goes forth, as they teach the children, that's what that gift, that's one of the the main applications of this gift. Verse 2. For he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God, for no one understands him. However, in the Spirit he speaks mysteries. But he who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation and comfort to men. So here's the contrast between tongues, which is a gift for today. Paul did say it's a gift for today, but it is the least of the gifts. There are some people that will teach if you don't speak in tongues, you're not saved. Well, that's the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 2, you know, they spoke in tongues, right, when the Holy Spirit fell upon them. So if you don't, you're not saved. Or if you get baptized and you don't come out of the water, 
you know, speak in, in tongues, you're not saved. Well, guess what? That's not biblical. Can we say amen to that? It's the least of the gifts, but it is a gift we all should desire. If we don't have that gift, okay. But you know what? It is a gift for today. But then he talks about what is tongues? Tongues is us speaking to God. So even, we'll see this later as we're talking, but there are believers meetings where someone, you know, you have an after, who's ever been to an afterglow or a believers meeting before, okay? And that's a place where those gifts can take place, where we wait upon the Lord, and somebody may, you know, pastor's conferences that happens, and someone will stand up, and they'll share something in a tongue. Now, how do you know it's from the Lord? We'll see in a few moments. Somebody's going to interpret what he just said, and it will talk about, it'll be praise to God, not instruction to men. Sometimes people say they're speaking in a tongue, and then I find it odd that they always interpret it themselves. Okay. So they speak it, and they interpret it, and then it's a message specific to men or even about somebody in the room. That's not biblical because that's not what the Bible says tongues are. Amen? Guys, this is why we want to know what the Bible says. Can we say amen? Because what happens is gifts get twisted all out of proportion because the Word of God ceases to be the authority. That's why you had people barking in the Spirit in Toronto. You guys remember the Toronto blessing if you've been around a while? Then down in Florida, they, were, they had to have drunk tanks because people were so filled with the Holy Spirit, they were spiritually drunk and they couldn't drive home and they had to sleep it off. Where's that in the Bible? <laughs> people were roaring like lions in the Spirit. I said, well, that's, that's interesting because the Bible says that Satan is a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. So I find it odd that you're roaring in the spirit. See, none of that is biblical. Amen? But here's what happens when you have people who are unlearned and they get in a place with a pastor or somebody who's leading the church who doesn't study what the Word of God says. He's trying to whip people up with emotion. Oh, there were gold flakes of dust flying out. They found they were putting gold flakes in the vent. Oh, it's the Holy Spirit raining gold flakes on us. Not in the Bible. Guys, we don't need to add to the Word of God. The Word of God's sufficient. Can we say amen to that? We don't need to stir up stuff that's not true. Does God still heal people today? What's the answer? Absolutely. But we don't need healing crusades. We need Word of God's crusades. Because when Jesus healed people, He always brought them to the Word. Can we say amen? I'd rather, look, I'd rather be born again than healed of cancer. How about you? Amen? What is the profit of man? Right? If you get all the things the world has to offer and you don't have a relationship with the Lord. So again, tongues are two different ways they're used. One's a prayer language between you and the Lord done in, you know, done in, uh, in privacy in your prayer closet. You're praying and God may give, you may speak in another language. God can do that. Uh, it's also used in a, cor- in a corporate setting as we'll talk about in a moment. But the greater gift of the two is prophecy, the fourth telling or the foretelling of the Word of God. So what does prophecy do? It does three things. It says there, prophecy speaks edification, exhortation, and comfort. So edify, the word, which where we get the word edifice, right? It's a construction term. It means it builds up the church. So when the Word of God goes forth, it builds up the church. So it edifies. It also exhorts. Exhort means a call to action. Uh, there's, in the Bible, there's a thing called the gift of exhortation. I've been told by people I have that gift. Well, you know what that is? That's, that's not just taking what the Word of God says, but it's exhorting people to take action. It's applying the Word of God to your life and calling us to do it. Can we say amen to that? That's exhortation. Do we need to be exhorted? What's the answer? Absolutely. You know what, by the way, if I just get up here and teach a Bible study, I can get up here and talk to you about the Greek aorist tense of the verb, and I can give you the observation and the interpretation. If I don't apply it to your life, I believe that's an incomplete message. Can we say amen to that? There needs to be an application. Do we just want to get our heads really big and have a lot of Bible knowledge, or do we want to go out there and live like Jesus? What's the answer? We want to go live like Jesus. Can we say amen to that? And too often you have people, well, I'm, you know, I'm a theologian. I'm a stu- Nothing wrong with being a theologian. I love theology. The study of God, I love theology. But if you're a theology in your head and there's no action changing in your feet and in your words, you're wasting your time. Can we say amen to that? And I have people, oh man, well, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a deep theologian. And I'm like, but dude, I've never seen you smile. Where's the love of Jesus? They shall know us by the love we have one for another. Amen. 
You sit, in, you sit in a dark room and study the Bible 65 hours a week, but you don't tell one person about the love of Christ. You never share your faith. All you want to do is condemn other Christians. Amen? Guys, we need to put feet to our faith. Exhortation is a good thing. It's a word of encouragement. It's a call to action. It, it gets us going. Amen? And then finally, it comforts. It says there, and comfort to men. It strengthens us. Guys, to carry, guys, we don't carry the load anymore. His yoke is easy and his burden is light, amen? There's some people in this room, I don't know what all of you are going through today, but some of you need to be comforted by the Lord this morning. Can we say amen to that? You need to be encouraged. You need to know how much the Lord loves you. You need to know that you're not alone. He'll never leave you nor forsake you, amen? And so the Word of God, it builds us up, it calls us to action, and it comforts us. It strengthens us so that we can faithfully serve the Lord. So it builds us up, it gets us going, and it strengthens us to carry the, Lord, carry the load again because the Lord comforts us. And it says again in verse 4, he who speaks tongues edifies himself. So praying in the Spirit, intimate prayer, adoration, and worship builds up the one exercising the gift. Without interpretation, it does the church absolutely no good. But he who edifies, who you prophesies, edifies the church. The message from God through us to people. It builds up the body because it can be understood by all. Again, my prayer is when you leave here, you understand what this text is about. Amen? And you get to know our Savior better. And I hear this from people. I'm not talking about our church. just any church where the Word of God is being taught. But I have people come to me. I remember in Santa Cruz, a guy came up and said, I've been going... To the, so to the same church for 25 years and all the messages are in Latin and every once in a while when they're not, it's very liturgical. And I learned more in one Sunday here than I learned in 25 years there because I never understood what they were talking about. Guys, keep the cookies on the bottom shelf so everybody can reach them. Can we say amen to that? We need to deliver the word of God and deliver it in a way that it can be understood so then it can be applied. Verse five, I wish you all spoke with tongues but even more that you prophesied. For he who prophesies is greater than he who speaks with tongues, unless indeed he interprets that the church may receive edification. So if tongues were necessary for salvation, would the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul say that I would rather you all prophesy than speak in tongues? If tongues was proof that you've been saved, that makes absolutely no sense. So tongues is a gift. God uses it. It's the least of the gifts, he says. Edifi uh, prophecy is something that should take place every time we have church. As good as the gift of tongues is, prophecy is greater because it edifies the church. Tur ch tongues with interpretation edifies the church. Prophecy alone edifies the church. Tongues by themselves edifies only the one who is speaking. So in church, the focus is on the body. Again, to build one another up in corporate worship, to use the, our gifts to minister to each other. Uh, tongue's primary use is as a prayer language, an intimate communion with God, and again, a powerful, pure worship between you and the Lord. So Paul's emphasizing the importance of doctrinal teaching in the church, and Corinthian believers had Bible, didn't have Bibles in their lap. Do you, know, do you know how blessed we are that we have this book bound like this and in our hands in a language that we understand? Can we say amen to that? You know, not that many centuries ago, virtually no one had a Bible. Praise God for Martin Luther and people like him. Can we say amen to that? Where they got the Word of God. The Word of God was only in the hands of priests. And they would have to tell you what they thought it meant, and you never got to read it for yourself. You know, Martin Luther was a, a, a monk, and then he went to seminary and started reading the Bible and said, what, this has got nothing to do with stuff I've been taught. He was calling them out. And then he ended up putting a, you know, a treatise on the door of the church, saying These are, this is what the Bible says and this is what you're doing. They don't match up. Guys, the only way we're going to know the truth is if we spend time studying it. Can we say amen to that? We need to read it. Read the book, don't wait for the movie. Amen? You know, B-I-B-L-E, basic instructions before leaving earth. We need to be in the Bible every day. Because, guys, the reason we struggle in this life looking for answers and trying to find hope and direction is we don't study the, the instruction manual for life given to us by Almighty God, and the Holy Spirit gives us understanding. Amen? And sadly, too often, we're chasing after the latest feeling or 
Again, uh, in those days, they would go, you know, in the time, of, they would have to get a scroll out. Where's the scroll of Isaiah? They bring the thing out, and then they unroll it, and the guy reads it to them, and they couldn't go home. So they would come to synagogue or later to church to hear the Word of God, and that's the only time they got to hear it. They might memorize it, but you didn't have an ability. So guys, while we are the most blessed, I also think we're the most accountable. Can we say amen to that? We're going to be more harshly judged because we have access to the Word of God. That's why I want you guys to have a Bible in your lap when you come to church. Make sure I'm not making this up. Can we say amen to that? You know, this check and see and make sure this is the whole counsel of God and it's being taught the way the Word of God says. God spoke to His people directly through the gift of prophecy. The prophet shared the truth with church and edified the assembly. And as a church, our aim should be edification, not entertainment. Can we say amen to that? If you're looking to be entertained, you're probably at the wrong church. We're not going to have a smoke machine in here anytime soon. <laughs> the flying Walendas will not be performing at the end of the service. We are not going to have a petting zoo in the, in the parking lot. And again, people can use it. Guys, there's a lot of, they call it church, and it's just a big, it's a rock show. And God can use, you know, technology, that's fine. But guys, I don't want to be blown away by technology. I don't want to be entertained. I want to be exhorted. Can you say amen to that? I want to be challenged in my faith. I want to be rebuked if necessary. I want to be convicted by the Holy Spirit. Amen? And we've, you know what we're doing? The Bible says in the last days, they will raise up men who will tickle your ears. They'll tell you what you want to hear instead of what you need to hear. They're not going to preach the whole counsel of God. They're going to water down the message out of fear of offending you. You know what? I have no fear of offending you. You know what I have fear of? The accountability I'm going to have before Almighty God on Judgment Day for what I taught you. Amen. That's what I fear. I, every, every, I'm going to stand before God and be accountable for what I've taught. I'm far less cons no offense, I'm far less worried about offending you than I am offending God. Amen. Can we say amen to that? Amen. And if the word of God offends you, if it offends me, we need to be offended. So point number one, the first thing we know about a gift, if it's truly from the Lord, it edifies, it builds up the body. Number two, there must be understanding. Look at verse six. But now, brethren, if I come to you speaking with tongues... What shall I profit you unless I speak to you either by revelation, by knowledge, by prophesying, or by teaching? Even things without life, whether flute or harp, when they make a sound, unless they make a distinction in the sounds, how will it be known what the pipe is played? For if a trumpet makes an uncertain sound, who will prepare for battle? You know, they would use bugles, and one sound was retreat, and the other sound was battle. You know, go out to battle. They'd blow the trump, and everybody knew to get up and go. They'd blow another, and it would get them to retreat. If you blew something that was half battle, half retreat, you'd have a mess. You'd have people running home and people running to battle all together. They'd be running into each other. And the truth is, if there's no discerning what's being taught, it's just noise. Amen? We all saw what happened in New York this last week. What happened in New York? They passed a bill that you can, you can have an abortion five minutes before the baby's delivered. We live in a, a wicked and a perverse generation. Can we say amen to that? You know what? If they were aborting puppies, it would have stopped a long time ago. Is that not true? But because it's human beings and it's an inconvenience, and I'm so tired of it's my body, I can do it. They're my children. I can't go kill them. Can we say amen to that? We live in a lost and a dying world. We've gotten so far away from the truth. We've gotten so far away from the Word of God. And you know what's happening? We've got churches in America that are, under, that are afraid to stand up for the truth because they're worried about offending people instead of proclaiming the truth of the gospel. Can we say amen to that? Amen. Lord, help us. The Word of God is true. Amen? Their governor said, of New York said, I don't want anybody, if you're, if you're pro-life, get out of my state. Wow. Lord, help. Amen? And this is why I'm not God, because that dude would be Apollo Rocks already. <laughs> Sons of thunder, bring it, Lord. We need to pray for him. Can we say amen to that? But what's interesting, in this section here, eight times, Paul's going to use the word understanding. It's not enough 
to the, for the pastor to impart information. It's not enough for someone to get up and speak in tongues. It's not enough for us to use our gifts if there's no understanding. If we don't understand, if we don't walk away having been equipped and edified and exhorted, then this has been a waste of time. We've done it wrong. Can we say amen to that? There must be understanding for there to be spiritual edification. The people must receive it for it to do them any good. It's through revelation, knowledge, prophecy, and doctrine. The foretelling of the truth, uh, the wisdom of God, godly instruction. Through that and that alone can we gain understanding. Again, cookies on the bottom shelf. So musical instrument, if I got up here and tried, tried to play uh, Rich's keyboard or Tim's guitar, you would all be running for the door because it would sound like a moose was dying or something because I don't have that gift. And the same is true for the word of God. Just as I can destroy uh, you know, what a keyboard should sound like because I don't have a gift to do that, so people destroy what the word of God says. Can we say amen to that? They'll misinterpret it. They'll change it so that it fits their needs. I don't get it. We live in a world today that so quickly listens yeah, it looks for the word of God, and they'll say, and by the way, Judas betrayed our Savior. Can we say amen to that? There are churches today that are every bit as guilty as Judas was. Because they, what do they do? They betray the word of God by changing the word of God to fit the sinful lifestyles of people that attend their fellowship and to make them feel comfortable in their sin on their way to hell. Lord forbid... I came to visit this church. I had no idea I was going to get beat up like this today. Guys, I'm telling you this because I love you. Can you say amen to that? Amen. You know that I love you. Verse 9. So likewise, unless you utter by the tongue words easy to understand, how will be known what is spoken? For you will be speaking into the air. If there's no understanding... You're speaking into the air. If I came up here and did an entire sermon in Latin or Hebrew or, or Greek, you'd all, be looking, playing, you'd all be playing Angry Birds on your phone. <laughs> it would, you'd leave with nothing. And some people go to church and they feel like it's penance. I have to sit here and listen to this other language. It, it's absolute nonsense. By the way, the Holy Spirit is the one who gives us understanding in the Word of God. Can we say amen to that? And that's why maybe before you were saved, you might have picked up a Bible and you never understood it. And now you open it up and it, and it makes sense. Why? Because it's the Holy Spirit. You know, I've been to Russia and I've been to India. I've been to church services where they're speaking in Russian. And I love worshiping next to people when they're worshiping in Russian because I know the worship song. They start having the Bible study. I'm reading my Bible because I don't understand. I'm glad they understand. It wasn't for me necessarily. But guys... We need to understand. If we, want to use, if we want to grow spiritually, we need to understand. It says there in verse 10, For there are, there are, it may be, so many kinds of languages in the world, and none of them is without significance. Therefore, if I do not know the meaning of the language, I shall be a foreigner to him who speaks, and he who speaks with me will be a foreigner to me. Even so, since you are zealous for the spiritual gifts, let it be for the edification of the church that you may seek to excel. We should be in a place where we can grow. We should be in a place where we can understand. We should be in a place where we can be ministered to. Where we, and again, it's, it's, it's the churches, it's, it's on us to make sure that we deliver in a way that you can understand it. Can we say amen to that? It's on me. I'm accountable for that. And that's why I am as repetitive as I am, uh, because I know that we need to be reminded. I know I be, need to be reminded. How about you? But be zealous for the gifts. Guys, if you're eager for spiritual gifts, seek those that will build up the church, not just some kind of spiritual excitement. Seek gifts that glorify God and edify others. I, I love the gift God's given me is because I love it that it glorifies God and it, I can... By the grace of God, in spite of who I am, I'm a martyred and perfect vessel, can speak and encourage others. And you know what? You all have gifts that will do both of those things. You will glorify God and minister to others. And if you don't know what your gifts are, continue to pray and ask God for wisdom, remembering again that a burden is the spawning ground of a calling. It says, Therefore, let who, verse 13, who speaks in a tongue pray that he may interpret. 
For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. What is, what is, this, is the confu- conclusion then? I will pray with the Spirit, and I will also pray with understanding. I will sing with the Spirit. I will also sing with understand, understanding. Otherwise, if you bless with the Spirit, how will he who occupies the place of the uninformed say, Amen? There it is in the Bible, by the way. In a previous chapter, we saw that Paul, using his hands, began to speak with them using his hands. I use my hands a lot when I teach, have you noticed? My wife used to say, if you want to keep me quiet, just tie my hands back behind my back. So I do use my hands. And you know what else people will say to me a lot? You say amen way too much. What does it say in this verse? How will they say amen if they don't understand? <laughs> amen? So be it. Amen? So it's in the Bible. He used his hands and they said amen. But how can somebody agree if they don't understand? How can they agree if somebody's speaking in, in over here in tongues and it's a knowable language, it's in Korean or whatever, and none of us speak it and then we don't have an interpretation for it? How, can we, how do we know what they're talking about? How can we agree unless there's understanding? And again, that's why it's so important when you come to church, the Word of God should be taught and it should, we should teach deep, deep truths but we should teach them simply so you can leave them with, leave here with understanding. It says there, it says, how can they say amen at your giving of thanks since he does not understand what you say? For you indeed give thanks and well, but the other is not edified. I thank my God I speak with tongues more than you all. So it is, he says, I thank God that I speak tongues more than you all. Yet in church, I would rather speak five words with my understanding that I may teach others also than 10,000 words in a tongue. So this is for your Pentecostal friends who go to churches where they rip in tongues and they go on for an hour and a half in tongues and everybody's just having this emotional moment and people are rolling in the floor and, and at the end, and then we, we didn't have time for the word. And Paul says, I'd rather speak five words five words of prophecy than 10,000 words in a tongue that nobody else understands. Does that make sense? It's so clear here, amen? And so you wonder why, well, I, I want to go to a church where I just, I feel it. I want to feel it more. I want there to be more emotion. You know what? There's a lot of emotion when you teach the truth. Can you say amen to that? But I don't want emotion stirred up by the, by the environment. I want emotion that is impacting me by the power of the Holy Spirit. Can we say Amen. And that's the edification here. There needs to be understanding within the body. And Lord, help us. I pray that you're probably sitting here going, he's telling me there needs to be understanding, but I don't understand what he's talking about. I hope that's not the case. If it ever is, please come talk to me, and we'll try to help you better understand. It says, brethren, do not be children, verse 20, in understanding. However, in malice be babes, but in understanding be mature. You know, in the way you treat others, in malice and anger and bitterness... Yeah, you don't need to be all that educated, but what you need to have understanding in is in the Word of God. It says, in the law it is written, this is a quote from the Old Testament from Isaiah 28, it says, with men of other tongues and other lips, I will speak to this people, and yet for all that they will not hear me. The Lord had sent prophets to Israel speaking in Hebrew, and they wouldn't listen. They rejected the Word of God. And we can... God then sent the Assyrians with their mighty army, spoke to them in a language they could not understand. And in this reference from Isaiah, a lack of understanding was a form of judgment for having rejected the plain truth when it had been brought to them repeatedly. You know what? We bring the plain truth, we share the plain truth, we speak speak it in love and do it in boldness. And you know what the sad part is? Most people will reject it. Is that not true? They'll reject it. And the sad part is, and we don't, we don't take any joy in this, it breaks our heart, that most, many of those people, they are going to stand before Almighty God one day and be held accountable to the fact that they heard the truth brought to them simply and they rejected it. Do we live in a, is our country rejecting the Word of God right now? What's the answer? Yes. There, there's, no, there's no way abortion would exist if we obeyed the Word of God. Can we say amen to that? We wouldn't have Christians shacking up with their boyfriend or girlfriend if we read the Word of God. Can we say amen to that? We wouldn't have people getting married to unbelievers. 
We wouldn't be you know, trying to define if there's 57 or 27 genders. There's two. <laughs> Word of God's true. Can you say amen to that? That's not very kind. To the, we need to pray for people that struggle with that because that's a, that's a mental illness. That's a spiritual problem. Can we say amen to that? And we need to love them in Jesus' name. But it's wrong. Pastor Dave, that's not very nice. You know what's not very nice? Letting people go to hell without Jesus. That's not very nice. Not telling, loving people enough to tell them the truth. Amen? Lord, help us. Verse 22. Therefore, tongues are for a sign, not to those who believe, but to unbelievers. How many just got a headache right there? But prophesying is not for unbelievers, but it's for those who believe. Therefore, if the whole church comes together in one place and all speak with tongues, they will, there will come in those who are uninformed or unbelievers. Will they not say to you, they are what? You're out of your mind. So if, if an unbeliever came in here and we all got up and we just all started speaking in tongues, we all just started rattling in other languages or an unknown language, and we're all doing this together, and they came in here and saw us, they would think that we've lost our minds. That's what the Bible says right there. Can we say amen to that? Now, why does it say that the tongues aren't for believers but for unbelievers? Unbelievers who came in thought they were out of minds, out of their minds because the believers didn't understand what was being said. The way the Corinthians... Uh, were speaking in tongues was without interpretation. There was no order. It was without understanding, and it was helping no one. It was an example to the unbelievers, even to them, that their speaking in tongues was out of order. Now, we do know that did God use tongues when He gave the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2? What's the answer? And, but here's what happened. They all heard the wonderful works of God in their own language. Right? They had all gathered together for Pentecost, and they all came together, and they could hear them speaking the wonderful works of God. It'd be like if we were here, and there were people here that spoke 20 different languages. There was some kind of, and they came in, and we all got up, and, we, and the Holy Spirit fell, and we started speaking, and we all speak in a different language, and it reached every one of those people in their language. That's what happened in Acts chapter 2. But notice, it wasn't an unknown language with no interpretation, because there were people here there who heard it, and they said, how are they speaking in my own language? How are they speaking to one? And I understand what they're saying, and they're speaking to me. That's when the Holy Spirit's moving and not men being whipped up by their emotions. Amen? Probably not going to finish. Don't panic. Verse 24. Well, maybe we will. But if all prophesy and an unbeliever or uninformed person comes in, he is convinced by all, he is convicted by all. And thus the secrets of his heart are revealed. And so falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is truly among you. The clearest and best way to not only edify the body and communicate with understanding, but to bring about conviction and repentance in the heart of the unbeliever is through the clear and uncompromising presentation of biblical truth. Just to teach it. By the way, I teach the way I like to be taught. I struggle if I go hear a message and I'm trying to figure out what the point is for the entire hour and at the last minute he tries to kind of tie it up and I walk away going, what was he trying to say? My prayer is you'll never try to figure out what I'm trying to say. Because the Word of God is just so plain and true. Can we say amen to that? We don't have to dress it up. We don't have to make it fancy. We don't need four points in a poem. You know, we don't need to, you know, we don't need to do, just, just open the Bible and teach it. Let the Bible out of the box because the Bible rocks, amen? And let the Word of God be true. Let man, God's Word be true and every man a liar. Verse 26. How is it then, brethren... Whenever you come together, each of you has a psalm, has a teaching, has a tongue, has a revelation, has an interpretation. Let, let all things be done for edification. God's divine plan for all spiritual gifts is that they edify the body. That as we minister to one another with the gifts God has given us, we are strengthened and we grow spiritually. For the body to be, un, to be edified, there must be understanding. I'm going to go ahead and finish. Hopefully I won't go over by a few minutes, but if I do, where are you going? Amen? Last point, they edify, they must be uh, understood, and finally, they must be done decently and in order. It says here, now watch this. We need to understand this is what the church should look like. Look what it says. If anyone speaks in a tongue, let there be two or at the most three, each in turn, and let one interpret. But if there is no interpreter, 
Let him keep silent in the church and let him speak to himself and to God. So if someone speaks in tongues in a church meeting and nobody interprets, there's no edification and it's of no value. Is that what that just said? And if they do speak in tongues, it's one person at a time, two, three at the most, and they will all be interpreted. So if everybody stands up and starts ripping in tongues, does that contradict the verse we just read? What's the answer? So again, because that, that, that gift is abused, doesn't mean it's not for today. Paul said, I desire that you all speak in tongues, but it is the least of the gift. But again, anything that happens in the church should be done decently and in order. Again, some today equate out of control emotional roller coaster ride as a mighty move of the spirit when actually it's exactly the opposite. When everybody's rolling in the floor, how is God being glorified? How are we being, how are we being exhorted in, in, in the word of God? We're just having an emotional moment that's contrary to what the word of God says. God is never out of control. Can we say amen to that? He's never out of control. Not for a moment. Even in his anger, you know, when we're angry, do we fly off the handle? What's the answer? But the wrath of God is a holy and consistent reaction to that which is contrary to the nature or the will of God. So even when he, you know, called out the Pharisees or when, you know, he, he brings wrath, it's always, it's never in anger. It's done, again, in order. Tongues again, there's the limitations that we see there. May we not lose sight of that. Verse 29, let two or three prophets speak and let the others judge. But if anything is revealed to another who sits by, let the first keep silent. Again, prophecy also limited to two or three. Let the others judge. They did not have the completed Bible as you and I do today. They were to test the spirits whether or not they were from God. And for us today, we have an easier task. We test what is said by the word of God that's in our hands. Amen? They didn't have the completed revelation yet. I mean, this, he's writing this letter to the Corinthians. It's, it's in our Bible now. But in those days, they would have to test amongst themselves. Does that sound right? We don't have to wonder if it sounds right. We can read the Bible and know if it is right. Amen? But that's why we need to know what the Word of God says. Because if you don't know what the Word of God says, you may fall for a lie. I've had this happen. I have to be very careful. I think we all need to be very careful but I've had people come to me and they'll say, well, this pastor told me 12 years ago, he prophesied over me in a meeting that I was going to run an orphanage in Haiti. And he prophesied over me. And it's been 12 years. And you know what? And this happened to my church in Santa Cruz. She says, I'm moving to Haiti to start an orphanage. I'm like, okay. And I'm leaving my husband and my seven children here. And I'm like, oh, no, no. No, that's not biblical. Well, no, this, the pastor prophesied. I don't care what he said. What does the Bible say? You don't abandon your family. Can we say amen to that? You don't, you don't walk away from your family and your children to go serve the Lord because you know what your first service to the Lord is your family and your children. Amen? But if you don't read the Bible, you don't know what it says and you miss out on what God has for you. Let's finish up. But if anything is revealed to another, again, let him keep silent. Again, when the Holy Spirit is in charge, again, uh, we're not overwhelmed and we don't have multiple people competing with interpretations, and the Holy Spirit's not the author for, of, an, of confusion, that all may be encouraged, exhorted, and comforted. Again, the goal of the gifts is to edify people. And again, the spirit of the prophets are subject to the prophets. So when someone speaks a word that they believe is prophetic, it's subject to the word of God. It says there, and the spirits of the prophets are all subject to the prophets. Verse 33, for God is not the author of confusion. That's where we get it. God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. Now, I probably should have stopped because it's going to be hard to tackle 34 in a minute, but I'm going to. Let your women keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but they are to be submissive, as the law also says. And if they want to learn something, let them ask their own husbands at home, for it is shameful for a woman to speak in the church. Now, we know from previous verses that the Bible says that women can pray in church. Haven't we seen that? And the Bible says that some women even prophesy. Let me give you the context. Do you know in churches in those days, the women and the men sat separately? You know, in the synagogue, there was a wall between the men and the women. Women were on the outer, you know, and the men were on the inside. 
And part of the context here is that when the word is going forth, she's not to stand up in the middle of the service. Hey! <laughs> Kelly, hey, Rich, what does that mean? I'll talk to you later. That's not what it's... We don't interrupt... Guys, I will say this. Here's one of the main things I want you to hear from this. First of all, women are not to teach men. That's throughout the Bible. Can we say amen to that? Amen. Women don't have authority over men. Are women less than men? What's the answer? No, they submit to men, so that just makes men more responsible. Can we say amen to that? And more accountable. And women, if you're not married, you want a man you can follow and submit to. Can we say amen to that? You want a man who's on fire for God and loves the Lord and will lead you spiritually. And you know what? A godly woman wants a man like that. Can we say amen? It's easy to follow a man who's following Jesus, right? Notice it says here, though, that in church, she's not to speak of a child. If she has a question or a concern, she needs to go to her husband. Is that what the next verse says? Often I'll get calls and some will have a question, and I'm happy to help, but I'll often say, have you talked to your husband? Well, he doesn't know. Well, you might have to learn together and then give me a call. <laughs> Amen? Pastor's not to usurp the authority of the husband over his wife. Can we say amen to that? Husband and wife, that's... God created that. It's picture Christ in the church. And what he's saying here is a woman, she's not to get up and challenge and question and ask what... No. Holy Spirit's not the author of confusion. And if she has a question, she needs to ask. First and foremost, would be go and ask her husband when they get home. When my daughter first got married, she would call me sometimes. She's my baby girl. I love her to death. And she'd ask me a question. I'd go, baby girl, did you talk to Kevin? Oh, I hadn't thought about that. Well, ask your husband. And, and if, you still don't, if you guys still have a question, call me together. Amen? And that's why you want someone who can be the spiritual leader in your home. I didn't have enough time to spend on that, but if you have more questions, we can talk. Verse 36, Or did the word of God come originally from you, or was it, only, was it you only that it reached? If anyone thinks himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that these things which I write to you are commandments of the Lord. But if anyone is ignorant, let him be ignorant. Therefore, brethren, desire earnestly to prophesy and do not forbid to speak with tongues. Let all things be done decently and in order. There's order in the church. God speaks through men to men. Amen? Sometimes with, with tongues we speak to God, but there should be an interpretation if it's to take place. This chapter was correcting a wrong because the church in Corinth misunderstood and they were having a free-for-all at church and the word of God was not being brought forth with the way that it should be and women were teaching men and people were talking over each other and guys, when we come, we need to let the Lord and the Lord alone speak. Can we say amen to that? And then afterward, hey, we fellowship and we can talk about it. But again, if, and it says there, anyone who thinks he's a prophet, again, must be in line with the word of God. I don't, I don't care what credentials they have. I don't care how many people recommend them. I want to hear them teach and I want to have my Bible open. I want to make sure that the word of God is being taught. Can we say amen? Anything else is a waste of time. And those who are ignorant, any, any would contend with Paul or God's word. So to today, all who contend or water down the word of God are ignorant. And he ends the chapter the way he started it, exhorting the members of the church to desire the gift, especially the gift of prophecy, again, and to bring understanding. He lets them know the gift of tongues is a gift to be desired, but it only edifies yourself. It speaks to God, not to men. And then finally, let all things be done decently and in order. You know, we haven't had much of a problem with this here, but as the church continues to grow, we may someday. And, you know, we'd have people that were just out of line and out of order sometimes as the church gets larger. And you know what? Sometimes they have their own agenda. And, they're, and, and look, if I go visit another church, even if I disagree with what he's saying, I'm going to talk to him afterward. Amen? We'll have a conversation afterward. It's not my job to interrupt. It's not my job. That can happen. But if it does happen, it'll be addressed in, a lo in love. Can we say amen to that? So... I told you what I was going to tell you, then I told you, and I'll tell you what I told you, right? So God's divine plan for the use of spiritual gifts, they edify and build up the body. They must ha come with understanding within the body, deep truth simply, and they must be done decently and in order. Our God is not a God of confusion. If you're confused, it's not the Lord. If you go into a church service and you're confused and things are going on that don't make any sense, that's not God's highest. Can we say amen to that? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. 
I thank you for everyone's patience. I know we went through a lot of stuff this morning. We thank you for your word. And Lord, we pray that as a fellowship, all we do here would be glorifying and honoring unto you. That, Lord, it wouldn't be done for the praise of men. We wouldn't be outside of your will. We wouldn't be operating in the flesh. But, Lord, everything we do would be done in the power of the Holy Spirit and would be done decently and in order that the body may be edified and that you, our Father, may be glorified. Lord, I pray for anybody who's here that's new today. I know that was a heavy chapter. And I just pray that they would feel welcomed and loved, that they would know there's a, a God of love and grace and mercy who loves them so much that he sent his son to suffer and die that they might have eternal life. And I pray that they would know that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You didn't come for the perfect. You came for sinners like us. And Lord, none of us is holy in and of ourselves. The only reason we're holy is because of the Holy One who died in our place. So Lord, I pray that we'd be kind and loving and gracious towards one another, that we are just one beggar leading another beggar to the bread. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, let's stand up and worship.